This is the official Pompey podcast. In this episode, club legend Linvoy Primus chats with Johnny Moore about football, faith and Fratton memories. So Linvoy, I suppose if we look at sort of the 21st century, and again, excuse the biblical pun, it's where you, where you were reborn really, wasn't it? Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that, uh, you know, my faith was a, a real launch pad uh, into, um, I suppose, an understanding that you know football is was an important part of my life as a as a player, but it wasn't everything. And you know, to to know from the the age of say 12, 13 years old that uh, playing football was going to be a, a huge part of my life, and thinking it would be everything and give me everything. And then, you know, once I became a Christian, I actually saw that football was part of my life. It wasn't every area of my life. And it gave me the freedom to, you know, to do, you know, to, to help others, whether it's through faith and football, whether it's through Pompey in the community, whether it is through anything that the, the club was doing. And it gave me a sense of, uh, like you're saying, being reborn, but in a way that, a, a purpose beyond 90 minutes on the pitch, you know, or a result and things like that. So, so yeah, it, it's definitely significant, mate. And, um, you know, and uh, something that, you know, is, 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 I suppose has connected me and kept me moving forward uh, in life after football. Did you believe that day when you turned up at Woodbury Park, Nigel Mansell's place, that you'd still be there 10 years later? <laughs> mate, I didn't know if I'd even get uh, you know, three days at Woodbury Park. So, <laughs> and you know what? It's funny. You know, uh, Darren Moore and myself were still in contact. You know, we see each other uh, via Zoom every week. We, you know, and we catch up. And you know, every now and again, we do reminisce to the the day that we, I can't remember who we played because we had three games in like five days down there, didn't we? And after the it was after the first game or the second game, uh, Darren, we were rooming together and uh, he'd been to see the chairman uh, regarding something and, uh, and, and who was Milan Mandrick at the time. And Milan said to Darren, you know, off his own back, he said, I like that boy, Primus. He says he plays with heart. And uh, Darren said, yeah, I've known him for a long time and, you know, he'd be a good person to get on board. Darren wasn't my agent at the time, but, you know, he's the, but, um, you know, but even from uh, Milan saying that to a contract being offered and signed, it was still, you know, a few weeks. And, you know, and from that point, yeah, you're right. Would I have thought I'd be at the club 10 years? Definitely not. And, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, as I look back, I, I, I don't ever remember a, a period of time in fall. I was so happy, even though there was a lot of um, not unusual turmoil in football because it always is but I was I was really happy in in the world of football at Pompey. You started with an own goal at Sheffield United on your debut but it, it, it actually grew as you went on didn't it and the Pompey fans took to you? Yeah yeah it, 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 again you know that even that start it's like we've Johnny we've seen players come and go at that club haven't we at Pompey and uh, some have started unbelievably well some have started unbelievably badly and and things haven't sometimes things haven't changed for those people and for me to start the way I did and to be able to be you know in, in, endeared by the fans and uh, be able to call Pompey home uh, was really special so yeah from from that um Bad start to, you know, uh, a, a sort of happy ending. <laughs> and you played with people like Sol Campbell, Sylvan Diston and the great Robert Prozanecki. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's again, and I, I'll say this not tongue in cheek, but, you know, to, to be on the pitch with Robert Prozanecki, I didn't realise, probably until I retired, what, how big that was because... Because football wasn't covered the same way then, you know, in terms of um, uh, European football, you, you knew about players or you'd heard about them, but you never saw them that often unless it was big tournaments. 
So when he came to us, it wasn't like, you know, um, uh, I'll try to think of it. Like, like, say, Teddy. When Teddy came to us, Teddy he had Sherry. a reputation. Yeah. yeah, Teddy Sherry. And when he came to us, he, he had a reputation of scoring goals, won, you know, Champions League and played for England and all that. But we watched him, you know, we watched him on Sky and we watched him week in, week out. So, you know, with Robert, um, it wasn't until afterwards I actually appreciated how good a player he was and his career. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, as a, I always say this, uh, Johnny, that when players used to turn up at the training ground, some, you know, some names, I used to think to myself, oh, my days, look, they're at our club and there's a little limb boy in the mix, in the middle of it, you know. So, uh, so yeah, really special, really good. Mind you, you say being on the same pitch as him. There was a time when you weren't actually on the same pitch as him. <laughs> there was a game against Barnsley, which which was remembered for many reasons, apart from the 4-4 scoreline, where Robert yeah. scored a hat-trick and walked off as if he'd you know, lost a million yeah. pounds. Um, yeah. You actually scored a Pompey goal that day, which, which yeah. is memorable. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, we're four two up with eight minutes to go. <laughs> you can see the penalty a sent off, mm, uh, yeah. and they come back to four four. I know, I know, Johnny. It still haunts me now. But I'll tell you this now, Johnny. I was innocent. I was innocent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, yeah, you that... were a pretty genial guy. I, I, you know, you didn't. You got sent off twice, I think, in your career, didn't you, at Pompey? Yeah, both at Pompey. Interestingly enough. So uh, what's mm. that, sir? Yeah, yeah, I think. It's, it, that Barnsley uh, incident, um, the, the guy I was marking, you know, he, he was all over me and the referee said I threw a punch at him. But to, for me to have thrown a punch at him, I would have to turn my body all the way around because where the ball was facing, he was uh, behind me on my shoulder and I would have literally had to literally swing round. And so nobody could understand how I could have uh, done that because that was what was written uh, as the reason I got sent off. So, Bit of a strange one, but you know, iconic that you remember it for that hat trick, me scoring and us drawing. So uh, yeah, pretty. Well, pretty it's good. Prozanecki because the face he had when he came off w- w- was a picture in itself. Not not the face of a guy <laughs> that scored a hat trick. No, and it's funny. I don't think I saw him smile a lot anyway. Apart from when you nutmeg players in the uh, in the um, circle that we used to have before training. So did he ever uh, have a word with you afterwards? No, nothing, nothing at all. I think we were in shock, to be honest. You know, because we, when, like you say, uh, when I got sent off, the ref gave a penalty straight away. So I walking down the tunnel, I had the the big chair from the Barnsley end, thinking, "Oh no, here we go," you know, and. Uh, I think we were all in shock in the end. I think, I, you know, I, I still speak to Graham Ricks now and uh, we don't talk about that. But I know Rixie was absolutely fuming with me personally because of that. But the reality of it was that, um, you know, if there was all the cameras that are available at the grounds now, uh, forget VAR, you know, we'll never go there in the terms of what that does. But um, I'm, I'm sure it would have proved that, you know, that it was it was much about nothing than anything else and uh but hey you know it's it, it's in Pompey history and I'm yeah. part of it now so <laughs> I'm sorry to upset Robert like that <laughs> you, you you named um Graham Ricks as one you played under several Pompey managers did you get mm-hmm. the feeling that you had to prove yourself uh, more than once always always I, to be honest Johnny I don't think in in any footballer's career you're never ever stop proving yourself, you know, uh, and, and I'm fortunate in terms of what I do now, I work with a lot of young uh, players um, in, in a support role. And then I say to them, you know, every time you train, every time you play, you're always um, playing and training in front of your next manager because, you know, players obviously evolve to coaches if that's the route they want to take and eventually to management and they remember things about you. So your attitude, you know, whether it's, um, you know, a five-a-side on a muddy pitch Tuesday morning after you've been, you know, beaten at the weekend towards a reserve game or a first-team game, you know, there's somebody watching who's got the ability to to make a decision on whether they'll keep you or not. So, yeah, I always felt I was in that position. And, um, and you know, and and with that, you know, that's part of the territory, but it's it's how you deal with it. You know, are you going to rise to the challenge 
or you're going to run away from the challenge. And um, and I think it, it, it's a lot about character and, and how you handle those things. So, yeah, I always felt that. It wasn't any different at Pompey, but I felt at Pompey I was um, at an age where I couldn't prove myself anymore. I was tired of trying to do that. I was, you know, life off the pitch was 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 uh, was was tough with my wife's health and and you know thinking where we're going to live and and stuff like that. So I was more I was more it was it, it is a tired a, a tired limb boy having to prove himself uh, to you know to the managers that were coming in. And everything like that. But you did so successfully several times. Yeah, yeah, and you know, uh, there is a resilience, isn't there? I think in all of us, there's a resilience, you know. And you, the, you know, when you've got your family, when there's you know there's expectation uh, of what life can look like as a you know um, uh, in your family life and in your your, your uh, sorry, let me say private life and and on the pitch. You know, you do build up a resilience and, you know, I was able to to do that. But like I say, Johnny and you, you know, you, you've you been a, a, a very good supporter of me, you know, in my Christian faith in terms of you, you've never shied away from asking me. I know that, um, that, that those moments where I had to prove myself, uh, it wasn't just done in my own strength. There was a, there was a true belief that, you know what, if football is the thing you're going to do, you will do it. There was a real true belief, but where that was going to be, I wasn't sure, but I wanted it to be at Pompey and I wanted it because of what was going on away from football in terms of in the community and things like that. I wanted it more than uh, and that. So that that helped give me the feel to, you know, to help change managers' minds who, who may have had a thought about me or who wanted to bring other people in. And, you know, and one one of the things I used to love um, fans saying to me, you know, Harry, Peter, you know, Joe, Jim, uh, Joe Jordan, Jim Smith, they can all sign these uh, million pound players and stuff. You know, they're wasting their money because Lynn, you'll be back in. You know, yeah. so uh, so with all of that, it was it was it was good. And like I say, and the appreciation from the fans uh, because of that that never say die attitude. Uh, you know, uh, I warm to because, you know, I'm sure most of the fans, if not all of the fans, if they had an opportunity to put that shirt on and, you know, play for the club, they'd give everything. And I'm, I'm sure they saw that in me. It was amazing because for a religious man, you almost exclusively kept your goals for Boxing Day. You scored one at the <laughs> Palace. You scored uh, two at West Ham, which was around the corner from where you were born. Was that, uh, was that a deliberate thing? Well, to be fair, Johnny, you know me, mate. You, you said it was a rarity for me to score. So the ball, you know, coming off my head and going into the into the net, I'm still in shock today. So, uh, <laughs> and, you know, the timing of it could have been any better. I think too, too many players, too many of the opposition players were, had too much Christmas dinner, so they couldn't keep up with me. So, uh, but yeah, it was like, it, you know, the irony of it, it was it, it's quite amazing and, you know, we used to, Mick Mellows, you know, who, former player and, you know, uh, part of the chaplaincy team, um, we, 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 we laugh about it even now. And, and lots of other people laugh about it because there haven't really been many significant moments on Boxing Day for, uh, for the club. And so, you know, when it comes around to Christmas and, it, you know, the, 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 the talk about the two goals and the goal at Palace, um being fresh in people's minds. You think how long ago that was, Johnny, uh, mm-hmm. and what the club has been through and the successes and the, you know, the upsets that have taken place uh, since. Um, but still, Boxing Day significant for, for those goals. So, yeah, more of a surprise to me. And believe me, my eyes were closed every time I headed the ball, so I don't know <laughs> how it ended up in the net. <laughs> Do you miss football and the adulation? Do, does one ever get over it? I don't, I don't miss the adulation because when you think about it, uh, when you're a 13 year old playing football, or not even that, when you're playing football with your friends uh, in like a school, you know, you, you, you play because it's fun and then you realise, oh, uh, someone like that, you know, you know, you win a game and someone else like that. And then once you become, uh, once you come into the the world of professional football from the age of 12, 13, 14, um, you realise that, 
the adulation is I need to please the manager. If I need to get a contract, I need to please the coach. Uh, and then if you are able to do that and become a pro, it's like, okay, you've pleased the manager, you've pleased the coach. Who do I need to please now? Oh, the, uh, the fans, because they're giving me something back. And actually, you strip it all away. You know, you just want to play football. You know, strip it all back. You just want to play football. So the only thing I really miss is the competition. You know, knowing that whether it's a training session or it's a game on a Saturday, it's the competition. I'm up against my opponent. I want to I want to beat my opponent. You know, I want to win. Uh, but my opponent wants to beat me. So hopefully we can bring out the best of each other. And, and competition is that, bringing out the best in each other. And that's what I really miss because... Um, because, you, you know, you try and transfer it into other things and it, it, it's not quite the same. And the reaction of the crowd does help, you know, the crowd pushing you and, you know, and you get in, you know, accolades for it does help. But if that's why you do it, it will, it, you know, slowly but surely um, not be enough. It won't be enough because you'll you'll look for adulation in other ways, in other things. And uh, so, no, don't miss that. But understand that how you can get drawn to it like a drug. I can definitely understand that. But I definitely miss the competition, though. Of all the tackles you ever made, I remember one, and you'll probably remember it as well. Um, mm. It was made against Wayne Rooney when he was in on goal and he looked certain the score. And I think they'd come back from 2 nil down and it was 2-1. Mm. and you came in from nowhere and put yeah. in this blinding tackle that stopped him. And I think it was replayed and replayed on Match of the Day. Yeah. Uh, do you remember it? And, uh, I do. How, I how do. did it come about? I watch it every night, Joey, before <laughs> I go. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Again, um, you know, I, I recently, because I'm, I'm going to be doing some stuff with academies, I've recently asked for some footage to be uh sent to me and, and that was on there and I didn't realize how um and I'm, I'm, I'm not being big-headed about it, how good a tackle that was because the art of tackling's changed now you can't tackle the way we used to back in the day and I'm not giving it the old old football different you can't play it the same way but and um and it was from my own mistake because I was out of position you know it's a flick on I was the wrong side of Rooney so and I remember running back and, it, you know, it felt like, you know, a lifetime to for him running through and me making that tackle. But it was a split second. I had a moment where I could have brought him down outside the box. But I would have been sent off. Mm. And I thought, bring him down, bring him down. I thought, no, 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 no. And li literally split second. And I thought, I've got to go for it now. And it was just to, to make that tackle. And, and yeah, it was amazing and to, for it to be captured as well um, was, was, was really special. And I, I've got to say, you know, that's probably my best tackles in terms of what it could have done. And because of the, you know, who we were up against, it made it more significant. I've probably done, you know, similar tackles playing against Torquay, you know, when I was, when I was at Barnet or, you know, playing against Halifax or, you know, but because it wasn't caught on camera or because the, the opposition wasn't as high profile as who we were playing that day, made it a bit more uh, iconic and, and and special. But, you know, I've probably done that, you know, a number of times because, <laughs> because like I say, I was, out of, I was in the wrong position, got caught out of position, so I had to make up for it some way. Otherwise, I don't think I would, I would have had Harry, you know, tearing my head off at the end of the game saying, look, out of position again, there you are. You know, so, yeah, so it was nice to, to be able to make that tackle and, um, you know, and it still be remembered today. You shouldn't really mention that because nobody will ever remember you were out of position. They'll remember the tackle. <laughs> did, did Rooney ever remark on it? Uh, no, funnily enough. I think he was more angry because he jumps up afterwards, you know, claiming that it was a penalty and... <laughs> And um, I think uh, Ryan Giggs got round the referee as well. And I think in that moment, obviously, it went for a corner and it, it went on. And I don't know if you remember it, but in the first half, there was something quite similar to that as well, where, you know, he he was at the um, Milton end uh, 
let's say I say North stand in the corner and he clipped the ball in front of me at the edge of the box and I got a toe to it and he went over my foot then and that that was a bit dubious. So, you know, I think he was probably angry that out of both uh, opportunities to get a penalty he did and so no, he never remarked on it. And the stand innovation you received when you came on as a substitute against Sunderland in the mm. Premier League, your last game, I think it was. Yeah. Um, that must mean a hell of a lot to you and, and it epitomise what people felt. Yeah, yeah, and and I think with that, if I'd have known that would be my last uh, appearance um, for Pompey, I would have probably took it in a lot more at the time uh, because I, I I just expected that you know I think I'd been out on loan uh, in that time. Harry had left, Tony had come in, Tony Adams had uh, had then gone, and Paul Hart was in now with Brian Kidd, I think, and. Uh, and, you know, on the way to the game, he just said to me, Lynn, if there's an opportunity to get you on tonight, we will, because uh, the fans deserve it. Um, so, yeah, to, to have that that standing ovation was, was a memorable moment. But I don't, like I said, I didn't appreciate it enough because I never thought that was going to be my last, you know, last appearance, you know, in the, in, in, in the team like that. So, but yeah, you know, and again, you think, at the start, scoring an own goal where people have probably been standing up to shout me off the pitch <laughs> to finishing where people were shouting to get me on the pitch and, you know, giving me that standing ovation, you know. Um, yeah, just thank you. It's a real thank you because I don't think I've ever been able to say thank you, um, you know, in the way I have. Uh, but I suppose my thank you was to be able to serve the community and get out and help people uh, believe in themselves because I think that's the big thing. I probably, my lack of self-belief in my years of football probably didn't display on the pitch that much, but, you know, going into games and, you know, thinking about games, I, you know, there's a lot of uh, lack of self-belief and, you know, to be able to go into the community and encourage people that you are more than your environment, you are more than what people say about you. Um, and give an opportunity for people to to believe in themselves um, might have been some way of, of me being able to say thank you. And basically, from Woodbury Park in 2000, we still can't get rid of you. I know, I know. That's the thing. I've seen, I've seen them come, I've seen them go, and I'm still here. <laughs> but what a great, you know, Johnny, to to have an association with a club with an area that I wasn't even born. You know, I, I was born in East London um, and, you know, to be able to to call Portsmouth my home, you know, way beyond football, way beyond, you know, uh, anything to do with the sport, it, you know, it's a privilege and, um, you know, and I don't take it lightly in any which way. But while I'm here, you know, I, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference in some way, you know, the thing I always remember, somebody invested in me, you know, a number of people have invested in me, uh, you know, but somebody invested in me, give me the opportunity. And uh, if I can do that to help others, I will. And and let me just say as well that, you know, as on my own, I can't do this. You know, uh, you know, I, I might be an ambassador and, you know, I might be a face. Of it. I can't do this on my own. It's impossible. It's a team. It's a team. And I'm part of a team. And, uh, Hopefully in years to come, this, what people have done on the past, we're standing on great shoulders and hopefully, you know, we'll be the shoulders for the next generation to, to build on. And uh, that's what we want. Then more lovely to talk to you. You too, Johnny. Always a pleasure, mate. Really is. 